Jordan and Gretzky, Serena and Ruth Remembering great ones is easy to do But what if after no days you spent their whole lives Lost at the footballs and catching sack flies Their guys, remember that guy Just gonna remember some guys now. Everybody, picture it. Here we go. Feel it. Yes. Are you kidding me? Yes. Tony Hawk. Everybody, look at this down there. And remember that guy. The show where we mine our memories for nuggets of nostalgia about peripheral players, past and present. Hey there, folks. It's me, James, one of your hosts. And we're not catching any air, but we are happy for you to be catching us on the air yet again. We're back on the air. We're in the air. We are. Very excited to be back, and we're also very excited to have our special guest. He's the man who did the first 1440. Tony Hawk can take that 1080 and shove it up his ass, but please introduce yourself. Yeah, you know, it took uh, being on a big air ramp and breaking all of the bones in my lower body, but I did land it, and then immediately, again, everything shattered, but it's me, the very special guest, Xavier. Xavier, we're happy to have you checking in from the trauma wing. Uh, how have they been treating you? Did you get a good holiday meal at the hospital? No, they made me watch the Jets on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? At it was essentially was torture. Saying, has that caused you more injuries than the jump? Yes. Yes. Every I time mean, I say they can't hurt me anymore, and they find a way. <laughs> well, I, I mean, a genuine question, because we are just a little under an hour removed from the pick six Hail Mary. Where does it rank in Thanksgiving week disappointments from the Jets as compared to the butt fumble? Yeah, how many butt fumbles does that equal? That's the thing. Like, I think most Jets fans, the butt fumble is so played out, it doesn't even bother me anymore. It's just annoying because, you know, every Thanksgiving they're going to show it. Like, no matter what else is going on, they're just going to show it. And it's like, 13 years in a row, I've seen this same clip showed 40 times during Thanksgiving. It it literally does not bother me. And I don't think it bothers Mark Sanchez anymore. So, you know, well, then, it's whatever. Let's look on the bright side of this. Maybe this 99-yard interception return to close out the half of a game is bad enough to start being the new clip played instead of the butt fumble. There's your silver lining. It's a Tim Boyle, in, like, pick six, like, Hail Mary pick six. Is that really something to celebrate? I'm not sure. Like, at least with Mark Sanchez and the Jets, this was coming off of two straight AFC Championship game appearances, and they got just totally destroyed by the Patriots. But this is a a Jets team that has the literal worst offense in modern NFL history. Not hyperbole, actual fact. So, you know, when when your offense completes... 23% of your third downs and 25% of red zone opportunities whenever you get there has not scored an offensive touchdown in a month and a half and is on its third string quarterback and 11th and 12th string offensive lineman. I I don't think you could celebrate anything against them. I heard the ether beat underneath those statistics that you were listening (laughs) on. I think you should look at this pick six positively because look, a Jets quarterback did just throw a 99 yard touchdown to close the half. Honestly, I think the funniest thing here is how the fuck did the Eagles lose to this team? The Eagles might not lose again, and they will have lost to a team. I don't think the Jets will win another game this season. Do you think Jets fans are going to start pulling really, really hard for the Eagles if they make the playoffs just to have that feather in their cap? Oh, I already am. That'd be so funny. That would be the funniest way for this season to go. I mean, the, the Meadowlands, we've had enough miracles there on behalf of the Giants that it, it was eventually due. And it was the Jets' first win ever against the Eagles. So if you're going to get so it, sad. <laughs> why not get it en route to uh, being the only team to beat us en route to a hopeful, hopeful parade down Broad Street? We will see. But in better sports news, I want to give a shout out to Benoit Allaire who is the Rangers' goalkeeping coach. And he's been the goalkeeping coach for the, for the Rangers since 2004, a really long time. He's been in the news recently because Henrik Lundqvist was just inducted to the Hockey Hall of Fame, credited a ton of his success to Allaire. Nikolai Habibulin, who uh, Allaire coached well with the Coyotes, 
credited all his all-star appearances to Allaire. And Jonathan Quick has gone from being 36 years old with an 865 save percentage to leading the league with a 940 and being only behind Thatcher Demko in goals saved above uh above expectation. Like somehow the Rangers are 14-3 and 1 and all of their goalkeepers are incredible and a lot of the, a lot of credit has to go to the guy who behind the scenes has been just I don't know what magic he does but he makes all goalkeepers better. I'm glad that you led that off with Henrik Lundqvist giving him credit because there was a moment when you said he started in 2004. I was going to say, oh, so this is like being the offensive coordinator for Peyton Manning. Like this is one of those jobs where, oh, I mean, yeah, looks like you did a pretty good job by not getting in anyone's way. Uh, that being said, but fuck Jonathan Quick, man. God damn it. He really had to resuscitate that career. I'm happy for you, Xavier, but God damn it. What cost? Hey, you know what? The, the Canucks have Thatcher Demko and they have... A couple days ago, the top three point scorers in the league. I don't think they're still the top three right now, but hey, Rangers Canucks three and four right now in the league, 29, 27 points respectively. And the Flyers are trying their best. But other than, you know, my one very good team and one historically awful team, James, how are your teams doing? My teams are all doing well, and for that reason, I want to spend absolutely no time here discussing them whatsoever. There are, though, some topical things I would like to talk about. Let's run through... I got three bits. I got three bits. We'll go cool, bummer, cool. We'll start with college sports. We have mentioned in this space before Aaron Matson. Aaron Matson is a former star field hockey player for UNC, who spent almost no time being a former star UNC player before she became a star UNC coach. And she spent very, very little time before coming a championship winning UNC coach. She has now in her first ever season, won her fifth championship in her sixth year at UNC as either a player or a coach. She has unsurprisingly, after being named head coach at the age of 22, now become the youngest NCAA championship winning coach of any sport whatsoever it it's just astounding to me that unc's field hockey a program with a very strong history again karen shelton the coach that she replaced who had coached for over four decades had been a 23 year old when she was named the head coach of that team before then 42 years later handing the reins over to aaron Matson. so it really is just something to see that and God, how good it must feel. I have not written down in my notes the team that beat them in that one season that they didn't make it. But literally, like Aaron Matson, she started her career at UNC 47 and 0 as a player. And she is currently now, as a combined player and coach, 117 and 11 all time. Seven of those losses are from one season in which they still went 13 and 7. So Aaron Matson, fucking insane. I'm, I must shout out. That she went to Unionville High School, Unionville, one of Adam Grove's mm-hmm, rivals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, she's much like Tara Lipinski, Philly native. We love it. Just got, um, got to shout it out. You know, she had to prove herself against the Red Devils before she could prove herself against the rest of the nation. Um, I like to think we, we played a small part. It seems like that might be the last time she faced any challenge whatsoever. Because as soon as she got to UNC, it was like, this is child's play. Astounding. Astounding. Let's talk about the shitty thing. Folks, it is Native American Heritage Month, Indigenous American Heritage Month. You can use many terms for it, but it is November, and the NHL is having a Native American night. However, the NHL is having some issues with its public image. You may have heard about this recently. Here, perhaps, uh, when we were talking about how shitty they were about Pride and other things. Uh, In addition to Pride, like you can't wear anything about any cause with the NHL anymore. And loath as I know we all are to support both a uh, stalwart of the Pittsburgh Penguins and a stalwart of the Las Vegas Golden Knights, we do got to give it to Marc-Andre Fleury this one time because Marc-Andre Fleury, longtime goaltender, legend, probably going to pass Roberto Luongo in a couple categories this year or two. He, uh, his wife has native heritage. And so coming up for Native American Heritage Night, he was going to wear a goalie mask that was designed by uh, an indigenous artist, Cole Redhorse Taylor. Uh, It's really cool, like clean design. It's nice. He was just going to wear it for warmups, not during the game. It fits with the Minnesota color scheme and everything. 
NHL still said no. Now he was coming into this with the MJ Phil Knight Nike idea, like, all right, whatever, give me the fine. I'm going to do it. And that, that had been the understanding. He was ready to eat that fine coming into this, much as some players have regarding, you know, pride tape. But then the NHL apparently called the wild ahead of this, having gotten wind of this and threatened them with a much, much worse fine. One that was enough to convince people to apparently not have Marc-Andre Fleur go through with this tonight. I don't know. You know, if he decided to do that, knowing that the consequences were grave for his team, if he did so, uh, all I know is that the NHL heard that he was going to do that and unhappy already with the punishment that they were making him eat in order to do so, threatened a much worse one in order to actually stop him from doing this. So tip of the cap, Gary Bettman, who really did see a lot of guys coming up in his rearview mirror this last half decade in terms of terrible commissioners and said, I'm sorry, I need to remind you all who the king is. So, yeah, fuck you, Gary Bettman. But I have a chaser for that shot. I do have a lovely chaser, my friends. Have you all heard of Barkley Briggs? Did you all catch Barkley Briggs yesterday? Yes, I did love this very much. But, James, please tell the people (laughs) about Barkley Briggs. I am uh, excited to be enlightened. So, it is the time of year to declare for the NFL draft if you're going to forego any kind of eligibility. Barkley Briggs is doing so. Now, you may say, who is Barkley Briggs? And who is he to announce that he is declaring for the NFL draft? He is an offensive lineman from Davidson, which is an FCS school. I'm going to just straight up read some excerpts from the post that he put out yesterday on social media, basically informing us all that he's declaring. While I only played during blowouts or when starters got injured, I refuse to let that stop me from being a, actually, I'm going to stop right here. And I'm just letting you know, I'm about to list off like a a very clearly self-aware, this is tongue in cheek, self-aware list of adjectives for like white bench players. I want you, everyone at home, get out your bingo cards. Each of you, I want you to each give me like one word or one term that you think is going to show up in this list I'm about to say. I I read this, so I'm not going to say anything. I'll leave this to Diaz. Just give me one, Just give me one. Gym rat. Here's what it is. Stop me from being a scrappy, sneaky, athletic, fundamental, high football IQ lunch pail guy. He did. He it, did miss gym rat. Gym rat was he, an easy one. He did miss gym rat. Gym rat's not on there. I don't know. You can debate whether or not he missed anyone in his list of countless people to thank. This included his family, his coaches, his teammates, Oprah Winfrey and Winston Churchill. Uh, I should also mention, as you're saying, this Barkley Briggs, in addition to having an incredible 70s porn name, also has an incredible 70s porn stash to go with that name. (laughs) Here's, Here's the last direct quote from his post itself. Many of you may ask yourselves, if he barely saw playing time at a non scholarship FCS program, why does this guy think he has any chance in the NFL? This is an entirely reasonable reaction, and I don't blame any of you for thinking this. I will provide roughly zero on-field value for an NFL franchise, but I'd probably be pretty fun to have around. This all, of course, came with a post itself. Like, this was all the graphic. Uh, The post itself, got to include a Bible verse. So this was Acts 2.15, respect my decision. Acts 2.15, that Bible verse, by the way, from the King James Bible. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Basically, these guys aren't drunk yet. It's only nine. So, Barkley Briggs, thank you for chasing away the evil that is Gary Bettman. Uh, Let's just focus on all those positive things from college sports between Aaron Matson and Barkley Briggs. That's what I've got this week. The best thing to come out of uh, Davidson since Steph Curry. Let's just say it right now. (laughs) (laughs) The thing is, that might be true. But Draymond's probably on the way out. They need somebody to throw some hip checks and blocks. And what better than a former lineman to come in, rejoin Steph Curry. As for myself and what's making memories for me, uh, it's me. It's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. If you yeah. listen to the previous episode, I wasn't entirely sure I was going to make it to the end. I did promise that unlike... Yoasha Chesky, I think it was something like that. Yes. Um, unlike her, I was not going to hop in a car at any point during my race. I did complete the race in three hours, 59 minutes, three seconds, which was under the revised four hour goal, which was in addition to the funny four hour, 20 minute goal. 
we hit both our funny and our real goal. It was an absolute blast. Uh, Xavier did provide the Coors Light after we weren't able to find Medaya. And it did go down the hatch, and it did stay down the hatch. I'm very proud of that. Um, it kicked ass, man. It was it was a lot of fun. We're now Thursday. I'm no longer sore. I was able to run yesterday. The first two days were really bad. Were really, really bad. But we did it. Genuinely, what are... Because I've also, you know set a stupid physical goal for myself that I felt the need to just feel some kind of satisfaction. When in the run does that start to dawn? Like when you see finish line, does it feel that way for you? When you cross finish line, where is that sense of completion that kind of washed over you? For me, well, first of all, I got to shout out the the four hour pacers that they had on the course were fucking awesome. It took away so much of the mental guesswork for me because obviously you're not running a steady pace the whole time. Sometimes you're uphill, sometimes you're downhill. They set the pace amazingly and like I wouldn't have finished without them. But for me, I guess so I always heard about people talk about a wall after you hit mile 20. And I kind of like questioned the existence of that. And I got past it and it wasn't until about like the 23rd mile when it started feeling like a little tougher. But at that point I was like, okay, if the wall's at 20 and I didn't hit it till 23, I'm in pretty good fucking shape right now. So in a weird sense, when it got harder was when I knew that I had it. Um, and then yeah, kicked it in the gear. My last mile was my fastest mile. And like, I know I also knowing that I had that last effort in me, like when I knew that I had that effort, that was probably, uh, when I felt it crossing the finish line, didn't really feel like anything spectacular. Like I, I almost like wanted to keep running cause I still had more energy, but no, nah, it was, it was, it was sick. The only, so that part was uh, a little scary when, when I hit the wall. Also, this didn't happen at all in training right around mile four. My right foot just went numb. Like I had no feeling in it whatsoever. And it stayed that way for about three miles. And that's not something I've ever experienced in like in playing basketball, football, all of my training running. I never had my full foot, foot not like ball of the foot where the pressure was hitting, just full on. Oh, yeah. It was like it was the whole thing, like the bottom part of it. Like I would say like I saw it feeling in like my ankle, which helped because like I still like kind of had that. I had that feeling at least of the ankle. But like when the foot hit the ground, like absolutely nothing. But after about mile seven, I would say. I got full feeling back and I was like, all right, that was a little scary. Didn't know if we were going to have to stop, but we're good now. Um, that's, that's why the dumb clippy shoes are so important in biking, but you can't wear dumb clippy shoes for running. No dumb clippy shoes. Insoles helped a lot. I guess the fact that like I've had knee problems my whole life and I really, my knees did not give me any issues at all. The whole training, the whole race, pretty nuts. Thank you, insoles. All right. Xavier, last year, I biked Philadelphia. This year, Diaz ran a marathon. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Next year, this doesn't have to be... What is a crazy physical goal for you? For you specifically. Like, whatever it is. But I I want us to set something to get a third straight year at one of these. All right, all right. You know, I, I I was there for both of you when you cro- when, when you finished your, you know, phenomenal things. So I want you both to be there for me when I watch every single second of a Jets game without throwing up. <laughs> this is tough. My, Ambitious that, is that different. One, that one fifteen k I did was the 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 biggest physical event I've ever done, and I can't imagine myself ever doing that again. It's all downhill. The whole thing. No, I, I'm not committing to anything. I can't. I just can't. I know myself too much. Yeah. I'm not the two of you. I, I hate physical activity and movement. So <laughs> I could try to say that I'll do however many miles on my treadmill, but I'm not going to count. I'm not going to commit to that because I'm never going to remember. So All right. We'll, we'll make you get through a full jet season without vomiting. I think that might do. Settle. Yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but in the meantime before the end of the jet season i'd like for us to get some more guys in and xavier i'm just interested to see how you phrase this one so i was watching a youtube video uh last week where ludwig chris broad aka broad in japan and jay schlatt 
were learning how to drift in Japan. And after practicing, they then had to run a course to impress a professional drifter, Daigo Saito. While I was watching it, I am a big fan of drifting. I was thinking, drifting is one of those things where the better you do at it, the better it looks aesthetically, which is not how what you can say about all sports and like all types of athletic accomplishments. And that made me think about all the people out there who do sports in a way where how cool they look doing it is the entire point. Like It's less about winning and losing. It's about how they look doing it. And so that's why I thought instead of style over substance, style is the substance. And because I was inspired by drifting, I think it's only fair to talk about the man known as the Drift King, Keichi Suchia. Hey, to Suchia, the Drift King. Now, I'm going to take a stab in the dark here. We're going to Japan? We are indeed going to Japan. In fact, we're going to Tomi, Japan, which is in Nagano, where Keichi was born on January 30th, 1956. Keichi grew up working class neighborhood, and at a young age, he started toge racing. Toge, for those who don't know, is a kind of street racing where instead of racing through an urban environment, in a lot of interior Japan, there are a lot of mountain roads that are very narrow and winding, essentially like switchbacks. And toge racing is two cars start one behind the other, and you just race through these narrow mountain passes. The car in front wins if they can increase the gap to a certain point. Car behind wins if they stay close enough to the car in front of them. Because you can't actually pass anyone because then you'll probably die. For and, any and, of our uh, Forza Inclined fans at home, this is basically Fujimi Kaido, which is the, uh, the mountain course they have there in, I know <laughs> at least, Forza Motorsport 3, because that's where I spent all my time on it. Again, this is all highly illegal stuff. This is street racing. Let's be let's be clear about this. But it is also a very cool illegal thing to do. And Keichi, you know, works like odd jobs during the day, does a lot of delivery driving, which makes sense. And at nighttime he practices his driving. Eventually, in the late 70s, he does get a chance to try out for uh the Japanese touring car championships. He has some success in this, but more of an entertainer than anything else. Later, he would say, I drift to overtake, not because the quickest way around a corner, but it is the most exciting way. And he, even if you wouldn't win these, you know, professional touring races, which is not the type of racing that he was doing on these toge races, everyone loved him because he looked really cool doing it. So mid 1980s, he's now in his late 20s, and Keiichi purchases is Toyota Corolla Trueno that he becomes famous for. And when I say famous, I mean this is like a really famous car associated with him. Uh, it's otherwise known as the Hachiroku, or the 8.6. And it's still one of the most popular cars in Japan because of him and his drifting, to the point where Toyota keeps having to bring it back. They stop production because it's an old-fashioned car, but so many people want to buy them to race and drift that they keep having to bring them back for limited runs so people can buy them or get more parts to keep them running. And Keiichi has a vision. Drifting, everyone who sees it likes it. And it is still illegal. He thought, you know, this could be something that could go mainstream, that people, if they just got to experience it, maybe they'd be more chill about it. And so in 1987... He pulled together funding from a bunch of garages and publishers that were involved in the street racing scene to start producing videos. The first video that he produced is a video called Plus P, at least the anglicized uh, version is called Plus P. And it's just a 23 minute video of him very stylized drifting through a a toge course in his local area. Uh, It's called the Usui toge right outside Nagano. So, to be clear, his plan is he's going to release a VHS tape of him drifting so good that it will change the government's mind about the legality of drifting. Yes. Sick. And what do you think happens? The government says, hey, that's a pretty good idea. We actually agree. 
I'm gonna, I guess Diaz has positioned me to be the cynic, so there we go. Something goes wrong. So, it's a bit of both. The government immediately takes his license for doing this very illegal thing, but people fucking love it. And these videos go viral, like, in the pre-internet sense of, like, people were shipping them all over the world because they just thought this was the coolest shit. Well, yeah, because now he's the kid that got arrested at lunch at the cafeteria, and he's the coolest fucking person on the planet. <laughs> and so, like, drifting takes off, and so does Keiichi. Uh, like, he gets his license back. He starts consistently competing in professional races. He rides in the All Japan F3, the All Japan Touring Car Championships, with multiple victories. Initially, he was driving a Nissan Skyline GTR, which is also a phenomenal car that's known for the Fast and the Furious. Uh, it is Brian O'Connor's car uh, in Too Fast, Too Furious. He also gets really good at drifting a Honda Civic and wins a bunch of races in a Honda Civic, uh, which I think is just phenomenal. He also did some Super GT races, which is the other end of the budget scale, where he's driving a Porsche 911, Honda NSX, Dodge Viper, Toyota Supra, and just crushing people w with that. He also went overseas for a little bit, and he started competing in our favorite endurance race, Le Mans. 1995, he finishes first in his class, and then 1999, he also finishes first in his class, and second overall, only finishing like one lap behind a higher class team BMW, which had the faster, better hypercar, and they still almost won. He's taken off at this point, and drifting, everyone can't get enough of it. Tapes are going everywhere. A young Jeremy Clarkson goes to Japan in 1995. Or when I say young, I mean young based on how old he is now. But it like it was 30 years ago at a this younger, point. A younger, a yeah, younger. He was probably Jeremy still Clarkson. like in his mid to late 30s. But where it's uh, Jeremy Clarkson's Japan Motor World, and thank God gearheads save everything on YouTube. It's so easy to find 40 year old things just to share. It's so good. There's a clip in this where. Clarkson watches a bunch of teenagers do these illegal toge races, and one kid sends his into a ditch, and Clarkson's just there talking to him through a translator and pats him on the back when he finds out they just wrecked a car his mom got him for his 21st birthday. Oof. I, there's one thing I want to get clarification on. So, based on the fact that he's riding in Le Mans, and based on the fact that, if I remember correctly, from Forza Motorsport 3, Fujimi Kaido, very, very long course, what is, like the length of these drift races that he's doing in Japan? Like what kind of distance are we working with here? I just kind of want to fully understand that context. So they're usually only a couple minutes long, but it's hard to tell just how far it is because it's so many switchbacks, but it's usually a, like a localized area, just at least for the underground scene. It's, you know what they, it's what they have. Uh, but it's usually like, five to ten minutes for a race at most because, you know, they cycle people in and out. I, I'm not sure what the distance would technically be. I'm it's sure they're different time, in different toges. Time works fine because, I mean, now you've used that to contrast that with Le Mans. We just yes, it is, not, it is not a very yes, well rounded is much drive. different experience than what he's yeah. what he, it's not like he was doing six hour races and then so a 24 hour race isn't that bad. No, it, it is extremely different. So Clarkson uh, in Japan watching some of the earliest like official drifting competitions on tracks that it's not there are now things that are not illegal. You know, he talks about how he, his quote Jeremy Clarkson is someone uh, anyone who knows him believes in speed and power. Those are the things that he believes fix everything. And he says quote speed is unimportant but style is everything. And he interviews Keiichi who, because he's so good, has to compete wearing gardener's gloves because they apparently just having that extra layer, it makes it much more difficult to do the oversteer that leads to drifting. So they have him have, use the worst car there while wearing gardener's gloves. And this is, you know, translation from the 90s, so not sure how great it is, but Clarkson asked Keiichi about drifting and how he became the Drift King because even... 95 he's still titled the drift king talking about toge racing he says when i was racing everybody knew that i would win so to stop people being bored and fed up with the same old thing 
I started drifting the car through the corners much more than the other drivers to keep people interested. This man is so good at illegal street racing that he creates an entirely new discipline to keep people interested that is now like a massive profession of drift racers across the world. I have to do this to handicap myself to make sure that this is still compelling to you all. Pretty much. I mean, th- does that, like, again, the gardening gloves to make sure that he's not too good in these drift competitions. But drifting, it's super popular now worldwide, but especially in Japan where they start producing manga just based on drifting. There's one called Wangon Midnight, which started in 1990, was serialized for. 18 years. It's now in his fourth different sequel manga, has been compiled in over 60 plus volumes. Keiichi was a consultant for that. Uh, Wong on Midnight didn't have a, like a big impact overseas, but there's another one that did, and that Keiichi is much more well known for, for manga readers in the US. And that's Initial D. I don't know if either of you have heard of N- Initial D, but it's considered one of the best manga of all time. And th- I just want to read the one of the st- like first sentences from the Wikipedia page. Quote, The story focuses on the world of illegal Japanese street racing, where all the action is concentrated in the mountain passes and rarely in cities or urban areas, and with the drifting racing style emphasized in particular. Does that sound familiar in any way? It sounds like a description you used earlier in this show. Yes. Keiichi was the editorial supervisor for Initial D because Shuichi Shigeno, the mangaka, loved cars and loved drifting and bought a Hachiroku as his first car and essentially based the main character initial premise off of Keiichi's life because of how much he loved watching this shit and wanted to make sure the drifting and the racing was as real as possible. And of course, the main character in Initial D drove the Hachiroku. This manga ran for 18 years with 719 chapters. There's been 80 episodes of the anime, five different anime movies, a live-action feature film. There's an ongoing sequel series called MF Ghost right now. Despite being finished for 10 years, it's still one of the 50 best-selling manga of all time, selling 55 million volumes. Again, all based off of the initial premise of Keiichi's life. It's one of those things where this guy took something illegal and succeeded. And just and, and essentially saying, no, this is so cool that we have to make sure that people do it and like convince the government and everyone else that it's so cool it should be legal. And it fucking worked. Keiichi, later on, he makes an appearance in one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm not going to have you guess what it is because it's the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. Because of course it is. He has a cameo where he is a elderly fisherman watching protagonist Sean Boswell learn how to drift with Lil Bow Wow in the car uh, trying to teach him. And he's just watching them drift. It pans back and he just in Japanese mutters, you call that drifting. And then it montages Sean Boswell learning how to drift better. Finally, to a smiling Keiichi saying, not bad while nodding. (laughs) Okay, so it, it's not uh, Mr. Miyagi, like, teaching him as the... No, he's just character. watching. He, he's just okay. watching as a random elderly fisherman, is but what he was so titled that's as. that's a joke that none of us Americans got that was, like, a massive deal of approval. Went fucking yeah, nuts. no, like, that's clearly a very good job marketing that to another country. And he also served as a stunt coordinator for a lot of the drifts and performed some of them himself as a stunt driver because he can never take the, the drifter out of, out of the car. More recently... He's been judging the D1 Grand Prix, which is the World Drifting Championships that happen every year, which he helped found back in 2000. So he founded these, and he's been judging them himself for the past 20-plus years. And, you know, even though he's technically retired from professional racing, he still does a ton of cool drifting videos, because when you spend this much time in a car, you're going to keep wanting to do it. And... He's been doing a lot of cool videos on the Car Prime YouTube channel where it's essentially like it's a it's a wild swing from the terrible quality but highly stylized 80s VHSs that he made and sent all over the world where you know now it's like it's super produced stuff 
but he does like challenges where it's like a modern drift car versus the drift king and it's like some you know hundred two hundred thousand dollar supercar going up against the drift king in his old 80s beater to see who's better and they're they're still all phenomenal even if it doesn't feel the same as some of those original just kind of like those original like 80s and 90s skate videos that were just, you you felt like the raw energy from just knowing they were definitely doing illegal skating but people just liked seeing it anyway all in all i just think that drifting is one of if not the best representation of style is the substance and i've just got so many fond memories of watching videos and movies of awesome drifting from such a young age so I just wanted to honor the Drift King himself, Keiichi Tsuchiya. I mean, anyone that drives a car well enough up and down mountain roads to earn the name Drift King has earned consideration for this haul. But at the risk of drifting off course, I want to get us to continue seeing who else can maybe challenge for this, who else has a bit of Flash and Panache. And Diaz, as Mr. Flash, I feel like you might have maybe some insight into that. I do have some insight into that and I have, I think, a pretty good guy to present today. Now, I'm not going to go with a sport where, it, to Xavier's point, in drifting, yes, the, the substance very much is the style. The style is what it's all about. In basketball, it's still about putting the ball in the hole at the end of the day. But there is a certain ethos of basketball. There's a certain way that it's played where the style is the substance very much. And that's street ball. Obviously, everybody knows about the N1 mixtape tour. There's all kinds of legends there, whether we're talking about The Professor, Escalade, AO, Hot Sauce. Uh, even some guys like Skip to My Lou made it to the NBA, uh, a.k.a. Rafer Alston, part of that 09 Magic team that went to the NBA Finals. And one really came on at the late 90s, early aughts, but... Streetball's been around for a very long time, and I want to talk about probably the greatest streetballer of all time. In fact, if you were to ask Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who is the greatest basketball player you ever played with, he wouldn't say Magic Johnson. He would, in fact, say the GOAT, Earl Manigault. And to be clear, this isn't just because of any potential distaste between Kareem and Magic. This is genuine, like, Earl the GOAT. This is genuine... Love Magic, but the greatest player that he ever got to share court with was Earl the Goat Manigault. I always thought it was Manigault because that's kind of what the nickname would imply, right? But that name actually comes from the fact that he had a teacher that made the same mistake as me, would always pronounce the name Manigault. And this also, you got to think, was back when the Goat hasn't really been known as the greatest of all time until I would say within the past like 10, 15 years comparisons between lebron and mj i feel like we can as a society trace back the goat to that and i think that's fair but it's important to know that the first goat of basketball is in fact earl manigault he was born september 7th 1944 in charleston south carolina he was the youngest of nine children and he grew up in very extreme poverty such to the extent that his parents weren't really ever kind of paying attention to him. So he wasn't actually born into the Manigault family. He was kind of just a kid that was just wandering around Charleston, South Carolina. And eventually a lady named Mary Manigault said, hey, little boy, I see you on the street a lot. How about you come into a house and have a place to have a roof over your head? And that's how he came to be a member of the Manigault family. But even Mary didn't have too much going on. It was just the fact that she had a literal roof to put over the head. There was no electricity. It was very much a shack, but it was a structure in which human beings could live. Um, so this was an improvement for Earl in his early life. But by the time he was seven, Mary would pick up and move to Harlem, which is where he gets introduced to the game of basketball and it very quickly becomes not just his escape from poverty, but it's also his passion. From a young age, he didn't just take the playing of basketball seriously. He took his training very seriously. He would play and he would train with ankle weights on to help increase his leg strength and especially with his jump to increase his vertical. The training's already paying off 
by the time he hit to junior high school. He scored a New York City record 57 points in one of his junior high games. So already on the back of this, you could say expectations were high when he was going into high school, but it wasn't even his performance on the middle school courts that was getting people's attention. It was what he was doing in the streets. Also growing up in New York City at that time was Lou Alcindor, the eventual Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And the two would often meet up on the streets to play pickup together throughout the summer. When it would start off, Earl would be hustling people on the streets. Again, comes from poverty, would hustle somebody, say, hey, let's play a game to 11 for 20 bucks. And he knows he's going to clean up against almost anybody that comes through. Quickly, his legend gets too big that he's not able to hustle anybody anymore. He's not just this 15-year-old kid. He's like, oh, that, that's the goat over there. You don't want to go messing with the goat right now. He was the type of player that nobody had seen before, very before his time. If we think this is the late 50s, basically, is when he's playing outdoor at this time. And to hear it straight from Kareem, he said his speed and agility allowed him to create so many innovative ways to score. He was an artist, as good with the basketball as Beethoven was with the piano. Basketball was his sole outlet for expression, and boy, he did express himself. Kareem wasn't the only person that he was playing with at the time. We also have Earl de Pearl Monroe, famous North Philadelphia legend, would play a lot of time in the playgrounds up in New York. Connie Hawkins, another one. And to hear Earl tell it, who he actually owes a lot of his success to, was his mentor growing up. Holcomb Rucker. Yes, the Rucker that Rucker Park is named after. Oh, is, okay. That is the man that mentored Earl Manigault coming up a lot. I, that's a pretty unimpeachable streetball pedigree. It is. He, yeah, basically the Naismith of streetball is, is who brought up Earl Manigault. So based on that already, you know, his reputation is huge in New York City. And... He's obviously got these expectations as he rolls into high school already. Uh, he's at Benjamin Franklin High School. Basketball scene in Harlem has really helped him to come in. But also in the late 50s and early 60s, there was also a big weed scene in Harlem, which does sink its teeth into our boy a little bit. Smoking all the time, but it's not really affecting his performance on the court. For his high school career, he averages 24 points and 11 boards at only six feet tall. The fact that he's able to get so many rebounds comes down to the fact that he has a bonkers vertical leap. We talked about the ankle weights earlier. He wore these all the time growing up during training. He had a measured vertical leap of 52 inches. To put that into perspective, Michael Jordan at his peak measured at 48 inches vertical. LeBron most uh, commonly taps out around 48 to 50 inches is what most people accept. I'm, the, I'm the trying goat to was jumping I'm... higher than that. I'm trying to think if I know anyone that's four foot four. Like I'm trying to picture a person that he is jumping the size of every time. Yeah. And, and clearing like, again, you need to think that he's clearing this person like just straight up with his feet. Not like he's having to, you know, do the, you know, go spread and like, let them go under his like, no, like just straight up under his feet, clearing 52 inches. Maybe the weed is a performance enhancing drug there. Maybe that's the secret. No one else has, has learned this at this point. Style's not the only substance, eh? Eh? Substance eh? is the style. Style is the substance. There's a little bit of everything going on there. Uh, and a lot of major college programs are taking note of the GOAT. UNC, Duke, Indiana are among the schools that are recruiting him as he's entering his senior year. But senior year is a bust because he finally does get busted for smoking pot. So he gets kicked out of high school right before his senior year. And this throws a pretty major wrench into the plans, but he's able to arrange to go down to the Lorenberg Institute in North Carolina for his senior year. There he averages 31 points and 13 boards. So putting up very good numbers, not in the New York City scene. So not against as good of competition, but still 13 rebounds a game at six foot. Pretty wild. And the big schools aren't really calling anymore, but he does get an offer from Johnson C. Smith University, which is an HBCU located in Charlotte. Uh, they currently compete in D2. But 
He lasts just one semester there before he's butting heads with the head coach and he ends up leaving the university. He returns back to Harlem and he already has this kind of base layer as this like young high schooler coming up, the junior high kid that would hustle everybody on the courts. So he's already kind of got a reputation here and he comes back to Harlem and this is where his reputation takes off to legendary levels. I'm going to just go through a few of the feats that he is alleged to have accomplished in the streets during this time. The top of a backboard is 13 feet high. The goat would jump up and place pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters on the top of the backboard for anybody that would pay to see the sun. He was also known for the double dunk. To envision this, he goes up, he dunks basically while still rising, grabs the ball with his other hand, brings it back around, and then dunks again, dunking twice in one jump without ever holding onto the rim. Does it count as four points? I would say it should. People like Joey Crawford or Scott Foster might say that that would be basket interference or something like that. But in the streets, you're getting four points. No doubt about it. To to complete a dunk while still rising. Like, I th- throw out the rest of it. To have been able to get the torque of your shoulder to complete an entire slam dunk while you are still going up in the air is unfathomable. And this is, these are feats that are not captured on video. So, like, it is, there, there, there's certain elements, and like we'll go back Street to- Street ballers, man. They, they should have had the same preservationist tendencies of illegal street racers. It was also like the 60s. That means nothing. (laughs) No, that's fair. If he came around 20 years later, imagine what we would have seen on the original And One Mixtape tour. The other impressive feat that is worth mentioning, he once was bet $60 that he couldn't perform 36 consecutive reverse dunks, which he did like without any issue. But while he is creating this very legendary career on the New York City streets. There's another thing that's kind of overtaking even weed in Harlem at this time, and it's heroin. Oh, that's not where I thought you were going. I thought, I thought you were going to go crack. Not crack. Not crack. We're going to go know, I know New York City at that time. He skipped right over it. Uh, he went to heroin, and to hear it from the goat's mouth. Quote, I was frustrated because I was out of school. I just went and turned myself on with drugs. I did heroin. I was messing with that stuff like it was the last of it. I'm not bragging. I was doing so much of it. I don't know if there was any more left. $100, $500. If I had it, I was going to spend it. He's obviously earning some of this money by doing his stunts on the basketball court, whether it's putting the coins up or if he's doing a reverse dunk 36 times. But you can only turn so many of those tricks and... As is going to happen with most people who do become addicted to drugs, he's going to turn to crime at a certain point to try to fund his habit. He was arrested in 1969 just for drug possession, uh, which was enough to help him to try to start to get clean. Spent two years in prison. When he got out in 1971, he tried out for the Utah Stars of the ABA. But at this point, he's been a heroin abuser for about four or five years. It's ravaged his body. He's not quite as skilled anymore, so he doesn't make the team coming from this tryout. So he returns back to Harlem after that failed tryout, and he starts the GOAT tournament, which is a 3v3 basketball tournament. But just days before the inaugural GOAT tournament was set to kick off, he was arrested for a robbery. He spends three years in prison this time, and when he gets out, he decides, you know what, Harlem is becoming a bit of a sinkhole for me. I'm going to get out. I'm going to go back to Charleston, South Carolina. I'm going to bring my two sons with me. I don't want them to fall into the same traps that I've fallen into. Down in Charleston, he's not playing basketball anymore, but he is trying to earn as honest of a living as he can. He's mowing lawns. He's painting houses. Basically, any kind of honest work that he can find, he's doing it to make ends meet. He also... Part of the reason he's not playing anymore, he has gone to the doctors and they've said his heart is operating at about 15% of its capacity. Oh, God due to, damn. Due to the years of heroin abuse. In fairness, 
most carts operate at about 50 to 55 percent of their full capacity his is tapping out at 15 percent though so oh so he only has one third of a normal human being's heart function instead of 15 percent right only yeah just just the third obviously he's not able to play anymore but basketball is still his passion so he does return to harlem in his 40s and he's not able to play anymore but he does want to be a part of the basketball scene so he restarts the goat tournament and he also starts a second tournament that was called the walk away from drugs tournament trying to be as good of an influence for these kids as possible what's really funny to note though is how he funded the walk away from drugs tournament he he sell drugs he secured this money by going to one of his former dealers and the former dealer thought that he was coming back to buy heroin. He was like, nah, look, man, I'm trying to start this basketball tournament. We want to get the kids, you know, a good positive influence. We don't want them doing drugs. So could I have $10,000 to help fund my tournament? And the drug dealer thinks he's like joking at first, but then when he realizes he's serious, he says, you know what? This is the goat. I can't say no to him. So the drug dealer gives the 10K to fund the original walk away from drugs tournament. That is very literally a thing that happens in season four of The Wire with Cuddy's gym. Like almost word for word setting up a boxing gym that takes place. So now I just know that David Simon ripped that shit off. (laughs) That's a great art takes from reality. And this was the reality of the goat when he came back to Harlem. He's trying to be as good of a positive influence as he can. He's also a child counselor while he's up there, basically giving speeches saying, I could have been just like Michael Jordan. I could have been just like Magic Johnson, but I chose to do drugs instead. And if you, as long as you don't do drugs, you know, you can do anything you want to do. Very much trying to, to set up his life as a caution against kind of the perils that he fell into. And he also got to see an HBO film released direct to TV that was based on his life, which he... Very much said, like, you know, it was it was shocking for him to see, but he does hope that his story can help to dissuade others from making the same mistakes. The cast of this is really worth going over, though. Earl Manigault is played by Don Cheadle. <laughs> OK, the, yes. Sick. The headmaster of the academy that he went to his senior year of high school when he had to get out of Harlem. The headmaster is played by James Earl Jones. Fuck yes. and. Another player that I didn't mention that the GOAT got to play with. He did get to play with Will Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain is portrayed in this film by Kevin Garnett. Uncut Gems was not his acting debut. I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that KG had done this. Neither did I until I I dove in on the uh, IMDb. But the IMDb don't lie. KG, Uncut Gems, not his debut. It was, in fact, playing as Will Chamberlain. That movie released in 1996. The GOAT did get to see it, but with his hard playing and hard drug using lifestyle, uh, it, it would eventually catch up to him. In 1998, at the age of 53, he would die in his sleep of congestive heart failure. What a career could have been, though. And we've often said on this podcast that guy recognized guy and Kareem Abdul Jabbar. One of the top five greatest basketball players of all time. I don't care what you list it that you want to say. When that guy says that the greatest basketball player that he ever got to share the court with was Earl Manigault. I think that we need to recognize that. And I think we need to say that Earl Manigault is not just the GOAT. He is, in fact, the guy. See, I, I, I think at some point we're going to get into a whole thing about whether that, that is something that can exist in harmony. And... Uh, I think there's a case to be made. I I don't want to dispute that for a moment. Like there's definitely a case to be made, but finishing off with that nugget on your argument in particular, like that's just definitely putting a pin in what the discussion's going to be. There, there there have been other absolutely no there have been other basketball greatest. players of all time, and, and specifically with basketball, I would say mm-hmm. in in different contexts. But look, I don't want to get into the litigation right now. I want to hear about the third guy that you've brought to the table for us today, James. I'd be happy to discuss that. And in order to do that, we're going to have to discuss extreme sports. We're going to have to ourselves all now in our thirties, get a little nostalgic and turn back to a a time period when 
that was certainly more in the cultural consciousness than it is now. And there's really, I think, two things that we as kids got to take in in that mid to late 90s period that really kind of crystallized the extreme sports thing. The first would be in 95, the extreme games. They are called the extreme games for the first year before they then become the X games as we know them now. And I mean, we all know that, of course, people like Tony Hawk participate in that with skateboarding and with things like BMX cycling, but also weirder sports like bungee jumping, sky surfing, street luge, rock climbing, barefoot water skiing. The X Games are very important because they make this giant umbrella term, extreme sports, kind of take hold in the consciousness. And then the next really big thing is, of course, in 1999, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Now that we've made extreme sports a thing, we need to figure out how are we going to best proliferate that throughout the society. And it turns out, make a little video game that you play for two minute sessions at a time. Tony Hawk Pro Skater it completely blows away any projections anyone could have possibly had. And so since there is now this idea of general extreme sports and one video game did well, Activision, the publisher, decides to try the same thing with a couple different sports. So in 2001, they do snowboarding with Sean Palmer's Pro Snowboarder. In 2002, they publish Kelly Slater's Pro Surfer. And in 2003, they release Wakeboarding Unleashed featuring Sean Murray. All of those, they do not become series. They are one and dones. There is one that I did skip. There is one other series. Now, it is a technical term. It is two games, but it is the only other series. So it is the second most successful extreme sports series that Activision has ever released. And that is... Xavier, you put up your fingers. Do you want to go ahead and say it? No, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to have this written down in my heart to say that I was right or wrong, depending on, on, on what you say. We are talking about Matt Hoffman's Pro BMX's very own Matt Hoffman. I was right sport, wrong person. No, we're, we're doing Matt I was Hoffman. Dave, I was Dave Mira. We'll get to Dave Mira. We'll touch on Dave Mira a little bit. But no, Matt Hoffman is the one that stuck out for me because I was a kid that played a lot of these Activision games. And so let's talk about Matt Hoffman. Two Fs in Hoffman. Only one T in Matt, though he is Matthew when he was born in Edmond, Oklahoma on June 9th, 1972. To parents Joni and Matthew, here's the thing, Father Matthew, two Ts. So I don't know what's going on there. But for whatever reason, Father Matthew, two Ts. Matt Hoffman, one T. Not one sibling, though. Several siblings. It's a big family. He's got two sisters, Lena and Gina, and brothers Todd and Travis. So this big old family, growing up in Oklahoma, and Matt in particular gets into things with two wheels very, very early on. You know, you guys... We brought someone with four wheels. We brought someone with zero wheels. I'm going to split the difference here right down the middle. But initially, Matt Hoffman is into two-wheeled things with motors. He's doing motocross early on. And still, you know, this is something that involves not just racing, but some element of tricks. There are some times where it's just trick competitions, sometimes where tricks add to, you know, the overall score of a, a racing competition. But motocross is not what we're going to focus on here. And it's not what Matt's going to focus on either as he gets a little bit older. Because while he's starting here, around the mid-80s, early 80s, around like 82, word is reaching the Midwest of this cool, hip new thing it's coming out of where other? In sunny California. In Los Angeles in 1974, that is where a pair of brothers, Devin and Todd Bank, they took some extra wood from a construction project their dad was working on. They built up a quarter pipe ramp. And this is, as far as recorded history shows, the first time when they start jumping off of this with their bikes into the air, that freestyle BMX is kind of birthed. Now, if you have seen the popular film Lords of Dogtown, you might remember that there were several droughts in the mid-70s in the Los Angeles area, and all of the empty pools that people had were a big boon to skateboarding because it was kind of moving what this sport had been at the time from very like precise groundwork elements, like really specific trickery and stuff that you were doing on the ground into vert, into trying to get air. And BMX is benefiting the exact same way. People are being able to go in these bowls and uh, just bust sick ass tricks, man. And so Matt and his brothers, they follow the lead of the bank brothers. They build their own quarter pipe. At the age of 11, gets his first real BMX bike. It's the sick red mongoose, and uh, things take off. He and his friends 
you know, they're growing up in this Midwestern town, but they're like the cool extreme sport kids. They make themselves the Edmund bike shop trick team. And this is just like all that they are about. Now they just go to the quarter pipe in their area, ramp off of it, take pictures. And they're just constantly trying to catch any snippet of this larger extreme sports culture that's starting to build up that they can get. You get to 1985. It's summer break for a bunch of teenagers. And he's like 13. And he and his friends, they're channel surfing. His mom catches them. They're not channel surfing to try and catch a show, though. What they're doing is they're going through channel to channel, trying to catch a commercial that has been released recently where a bunch of, like, pro riders from California are doing some sick stunts. And his mom sees this. And she gets the idea to call the local company branch and tell them, like, how much these kids are into this ad and that these kids could also do this trick. So I don't know if there's, like, anything you want to do with that. But this cold call, it lands them a chance to do some work with this brand. Fellas, could you please guess what this brand that these 13-year-olds are obsessed with commercial for in 1985? Thrasher. Thrasher? Diaz? 1985. It's selling you something. Who do you think is trying to sell you with BMX Rider? Because they were oddly involved in a lot of shit then, I'm going to throw a curveball and say Sears. It is Mountain Dew, fellas. Even here in 1985, these kids want to do the do. Uh, Totally fair. (laughs) So the local Pepsi bottling plant, because there is a Pepsi bottling plant very near them here in Oklahoma, Mountain Dew being owned by Pepsi. They bring them in and they just slap this giant Mountain Dew decal on their quarter pipe and just put on a show for the workers of the Pepsi bottling plant of these 13-year-old kids doing really cool stunts off of the quarter pipe. And so they get quote unquote sponsored essentially by Pepsi and Mountain Dew here. And they are like, they're sending money to the bike shop that they are the trick team for to, to pay for their repairs. But this is like their very earliest thing. And in order to pay for it, these kids are just doing the local grocery store circuit, showing up in the parking lots with their Mountain Dew quarter pipe and nailing a bunch of sick tricks. Matt is the star of the crew. And the next summer, they get a chance to do warm-ups because of their you know, local notoriety with a like more pro BMX show that comes into town. And one of these pros, like he sees Matt doing his tricks. He's like, I want to take this kid with us. He like tries to talk to his agent to make this happen, according to Matt. And at some point, someone's like, oh, we probably shouldn't have like an unsupervised 14-year-old just out of nowhere come on your tour. But good energy. He does still, that summer, get a big moment where sends a letter to the editor for the like big uh, magazine at the time for the sport, which was freestyling with a little apostrophe at the end. And freestyling has this letter to the editor uh, with the head title, The Road to Fame. This is all written by Matt. This summer, my friends and I got sponsored by Mountain Dew. We are now known as the Mountain Dew Freestyle, in parentheses, my kind of job. We do shows whenever we can find them. If anyone wants us to put on a, in all caps, rad show, our crazy bunch will go anywhere. Signed, Matthew Hoffman, Edmond, Oklahoma. P.S. Our ramp is so big, everyone calls it the wall. It's nine feet tall. And then there's a picture of Matt with the caption, Matthew from Oklahoma. This is air. I just, we, we do need to bring back rad as an adjective. I'm a big fan. In August of 86, Matt enters his first pro competition. He is unsponsored. And this was not planned to be his first pro competition. He was going to enter in as an amateur because he is still under the age of 16. And his dad convinced him. It's like, no, 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 no. Don't do that bullshit. Just enroll as a pro. Whatever. You'll be an amateur in the pro competition. It'll go fine. He is the only person that is there in like a full motocross helmet and, you know, protective jacket. And while on one hand, we might just say, oh, yeah, cool. We love a safety conscious king. It very quickly becomes clear to everyone else there that he is doing that because he is doing a different sport than them. Because this amateur 14-year-old does win this competition by just, he had come up in this in a very, you know, just him and his friends kind of way where he was stubborn enough that if he envisioned something, he could just kind of keep trying because he didn't know well enough to know that he couldn't go up into the air and start attempting 900s already at this age. He hasn't nailed it yet, but like he's has no reason to believe that that is impossible. And so he's just trying things that put every other rider to shame. 
He goes to his second pro competition later that summer at MSG. He's gone from Oklahoma to Madison Square Garden in exactly one stop. Goes to the pro category once again, wins it. Now gets a two-page photo spread in freestyling. And now they're when they're putting their coverage out there in November, I want to say like, this is a five-month stretch where he had in freestyling. A letter to the editor. For his Oklahoma one, he did get a like one-page write-up in freestyling. And now just two more months later in November, he is getting a full two-page photo spread. Freestyling cannot get enough of Matt Hoffman. And now, neither can sponsors. Uh, there are two like major BMX manufacturers at the time. There's Haro, H-A-R-O, which is probably like the better company and has the better team reputation. But they also tell them they're going to start them on the B team because they have so much talent. Whereas Skyway, which may be a little bit of a step down from Haro, will absolutely start paying him as a pro immediately. So he signs with Skyway. He flies out to California to show the bosses what they signed up for. And while he is trying to impress them, doing the crazy tricks that he has no idea he shouldn't be trying to do, he does crack the shit out of his clavicle. But he is young, he bounces back quickly, and he is a huge attraction for them for the next couple of years. In December of 86, he enters a six pro vert contest, and he is largely an afterthought in this because he's about to turn 15. But despite being a boy among men age wise, he is a man among boys. And once again, I like, I'm reading a lot of quotes I know today, but this is just one that I have to do as the full quote. Please indulge me. It's from the 87 issue of a different magazine, BMX Plus. Matt wasn't 15 yet, but he was by far the raddest guy in the class. He was popping off eight to nine foot aerials, no footed can-cans, regular can-cans, no handers, and all sorts of tricks. He was actually radder doing practice than he was in the run, but still rad enough there was no doubt who won. If he stays in freestyle long enough, it's virtually a sure thing he'll be the raddest guy alive in a couple years. He's kind of shy and quiet when you meet him. Not at all what you would expect from someone so radical. Have, have we quite satisfied your hunger on that front yet, Diaz? I've, I've got a feeling that there's even more servings coming. <laughs> well, I mean, he has become so radical that in 1998, he is able to depart from this uh, Skyway because the pro that was actually a huge fan of his when he was 14, Dennis McCoy, has left Haro. They've got room. They bring him in now as their star attraction. He is, you know, still to this point, technically been amateur. He's been getting paid. Uh, he finally, finally gets to be a pro pro now. And on March 25th, 1988, he lands history's First ever 900, a full decade before Tony Hawk landed the 900 that we opened today's show with. Eat your heart out, Tony. The problem, though, is that for much of his like tenure here with Harrow, there is a lot of friction between him and a changing ownership situation. Like it had just come out of the hands of the guy whose last name was Haro that had founded the company, and turns out the very first person to take over after that wasn't as good at this company and and kind of butted heads with this young star attraction and so you know decides i'm gonna leave the biggest brand in the game and he does something xavier that you are a big fan of he starts his own brand with blackjack and hookers uh he does not contain any actual hey, diaz likes that just as much as i do you could have just said something that xavier and diaz you would understand or you would like i was waiting oh. for something else there no, because there's no unfortunately. I'm not going to pull a Xavier unfortunately here. This is just an excellent brand that he has gone off and started. There are no blackjack and hookers, unfortunately. There well, you is, don't know that. That's fair. That's fair. There are no documented hookers and or instances of blackjack with the company that he's going to found. He is going to sit down with a friend, Lynn Caslin, engineer at the time, and they are the founder of Redline Bicycles manufacturer and like a very high class manufacturer, like making the really fancy BMX bikes at the time. And the two of them, they sit out and they work out what like the ideal design would be for the world's best vert rider, him. Like if they just started with the mind of the world's best vert rider, what is the bike that would kind of spring from that? And so they work this out. They find a metal that is like aircraft grade, essentially thing that is used for fuselage. They make five of this prototype model. They use the nickname at this point that he's earned to name the model of the bike. So it is the Condor. And so he gives four of these out to other pros, including Dave Mira, 
Dave Muir receives one of the first ever condors. And he also takes one. He basically tries to break it by riding it for several months. He does everything that he possibly can to beat the shit out of this bike and destroy it. Uh, though in his own words, he caused his body more harm than his bike. And finally, after a year, figures, okay, I've got my prototype. I've got this thing that I am proud of, that I'm ready to release to the world, and that I'm ready to keep rolling. So that summer, Hoffman Bikes releases the Condor model, manufactured by SE, I will just say. Full disclaimer, I fucking love SE Bikes. I think it's an incredible manufacturer. If you are ever looking for a new bicycle, you cannot go wrong with anything made by SE. How much do they cost? Not a huge amount. Um, I have a very nice commuter bike that I did admittedly spend $600 on when I first got it. It is a worthwhile investment. It's incredibly good frame. They build beautiful frames, excellent wheel rims. I have ridden SE in one way or another for, I mean, a combined like 11 years since I started being serious about bikes, maybe 15 years ago. Like I, I cannot say enough good things about their bikes. So SE bikes... I just agree with Matt Hoffman on that one. That's all. So as his reach is growing, he is also taking on more of an organizing role. And he makes the Hoffman Sports Association, which basically becomes like the biggest BMX organizer for many, many years. Leading up to, in 1995, the launch by ESPN and ESPN2 of those aforementioned Extreme Games. At the very first Extreme Games, uh, which, by the way, being held in the single most rad state of all, Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, is where the first two of these will take place. The thing about it is that, like, Matt Hoffman, I mean, yeah, he's 23 and Tony Hawk is only 27, but the way that this sport moves, it's not quite the same as gymnastics, but they are definitely, amongst them, somewhat elder statesmen. And so... A lot of this, much like those first couple years at the W, were coronations for a couple players who had already, through other international leagues, become very well known uh, also for their college careers. Like the guys that win the first couple X games, it is like, oh, cool, we finally have a thing to award to these people who have been the best at this sport for a while. Uh, that being said, I mean, he goes out and he wins the gold in his first BMX for competition and his second one when it is the X Games now in 96. In 96, other than those X games, he does go to compete in one other games. Travels south from Rhode Island all the way to Atlanta to the Olympics, where he is not competing because it is not yet a sport at the Olympics. It will be many years from then. It is now, of course. But uh, at the time, they do still want a BMX performance to be put into the closing ceremonies as part of a production that called Sports as Art. So already now, like the International Olympic Committee sees BMX for who, who do we turn to to best capsulate the art style of this new burgeoning sport? Matt Hoffman, get here and put that on the international stage. Those paragons of virtue and art, the IOC. <laughs> I, to me, that's cinema. Let's, let's not hold the IOC's correct approximation of his excellent <laughs> skill against him just because they recognize what everyone else recognizes that he is just the best at this yeah let's let's focus on it he continues to compete at the x games gets bronzes in 97 2000 2001 and in 2002 in philadelphia as a 30 year old now at x games 8 x games v i i i he lands the world's first ever no hands 900 spin on a bike which is as someone that is afraid to take my hands off the bike handlebars when i have two wheels on ground fucking bonkers an absolutely insane trick still somehow not good enough to beat dave mira in this competition dave mira wins gold by like 2.5 points uh, on a scale of 1 to 100 so you're However, saying his style wasn't good enough his style by 2002, you know, it's winding down. We'll acknowledge that. This is his best finish in many years. He does get the silver behind Dave Mira. But it is, as far as I can tell, last X Games appearance, or at least his last competitive showing. But let's talk a little bit more for a moment about that pop cultural place that he occupies. If we're talking about style. Because as I mentioned, when Tony Hawk Pro Skater takes off, Activision wants to build on this. They want to make some other series. They want to make more money. And they decide that BMX is the first natural expansion. So the 
the obvious question is who do we make the cover athlete? They turned to Matt Hoffman and on Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 on that disc that comes out, there is a demo for Matt Hoffman's Pro BMX with a fall 2000 release promised. They do not make that promise, but they do manage to finally in May of 2001 release it. And it is roundly received as pretty good. It's like mid 70s everywhere on Metacritic for all of the platforms that it's released. It is basically, if you've played Tony Hawk, the same game except with bikes. It, there's not a lot of like differences in gameplay. Uh, obviously, there's a little bit difference about like being able to maintain speed, which is just a difference between biking and skateboarding in general. But largely, you've got a special bar. You're trying to create tricks. You're trying to beat those quick goals in two minute sessions. And you are doing it with a number of different pros. You've got pros like Matt. You've got pros like Dennis McCoy, his inspiration from all those years back. Tony Hawk is like secret character in a couple of them. Dave Mira is not in this game. Dave Mira is in neither of these games because Dave Mira has a rival video game series over with Acclaim Entertainment. But that is Acclaim Entertainment. And That's the one that I play. Yeah, Dave Mira does have his pro BMX over there, but Matt Hoffman's pro BMX pretty successful. They are able the next year to release a second one in August of 2002. Slightly better reviews, mostly people saying slight graphic improvements. Though there's also one new mode that they add that uh, does definitely require some mentioning. It's called Tiki Mode. And apparently at the end of career mode for Matt Hoffman's Pro BMX 2, there's a level in Hawaii. And you complete the level in Hawaii. And then there's a special bonus mode that's a first player shooter where you are just shooting at a giant fireball throwing Tiki Man that is the final boss of this BMX freestyle video game. That, we that used to sounds about right. Country is what I'm <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That is the final game in the Matt Hoffman pro BMX series. He is unlockable in Tony Hawk pro skater four and Tony Hawk pro skater, American wasteland or Tony Hawk's American wasteland, whatever the official terminology of that one. is. There is one last extreme sports adjacent cultural touchstone that he must dip his toes into because again, there is that, umbrella of extreme sports everything that is coming out always has all of these reasons to bring things in and so when another cultural phenomenon now in the early 2000s comes about in the form of jackass obviously matt hoffman's going to have to get involved and so he's in two episodes of the show in 2001 he does appear in jackass the movie in 2002 jackass 2 in 2006 he appears in jackass 2.5 in 2007 in 2008 he is the feature of the first ever Jackass Presents film. Jackass Presents Matt Hoffman's tribute to Evil Knievel, which uh, many people complained about largely because the people doing the stunts, him and other pro BMX riders, were too professional and too good at the stunts. It, that also, does kind of go against the entire point of Jackass. Yeah. Like, and no I, and I'm not a Jackass it. fan, as I'm sure the two of you would probably guess, knowing me. Yeah, the, the whole point of Jackass is it's not professionals doing terrible, stupid shit. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's the disclaimer at the very beginning of the show. They are very smart in how they get fucked up. Mm -hmm. Like, Steve-O, master at not landing on his head. Johnny Knoxville, a pro at not landing on his head, except for when they had that skate where Butterbean hit him in the head a lot. Other than that, he did a real good job at it. He goes back to being a bit player in uh, 2010's Jackass 3D and is also in 2011's Jackass 3.5. In that same area, there is an ESPN 30 for 30 put out called The Birth of Big Air, largely focusing on him and the development of BMX freestyle. It is directed and produced by Jeff Tremaine, Spike Jones, and Johnny Knoxville, which is also known as the three-person team largely responsible for creating Jackass. So essentially... Everything on screen that this guy did from the beginning of the millennium to present is just a jackass related production, which is pretty awesome. There is one exception. In 2002, he's also in the Vin Diesel action film Triple X. See, now you're bringing me back in because I'm anti jackass <laughs> and I'm pro Dave Mira, but I'm also pro Triple X in Vin Diesel because Xander puts his rules. And he doesn't come back for the Ice Cube sequel that disrespects the spirit of the original. He's only in Triple X 2002. Hey, hey, there is a third one that came out in like 2013, and me and Rob went to Penn's campus to watch it in theaters, and it was phenomenal because it starts 
with Vin Diesel skateboarding on a plank of metal down a mountain that it makes it seem like it's something crazy going on. But he's actually in Brazil and he was stealing cable so they could watch the World Cup. So it must have been 2014 then. So they could watch the fucking World Cup uh, in Brazil with a bunch of kids at the beach. It was phenomenal. I will have to take your word for it, but I got to say it sounds pretty great. So I do apologize on Matt Hoffman's behalf that he did not make an appearance in that. And I will acknowledge that while we talked about the Drift King inventing that, and while we talked about kind of a progenitor of street basketball, maybe a little bit less so with Hinkay since, since he is coming from Rucker. He is descending from the line of Rucker. Uh, much like the GOAT in that case, Matt Hoffman did not create. BMX Vert. He is not the creator. He is not the progenitor. He is not the origin of BMX Freestyle, but he did take it on like an Apollo 11 type leap. And he made it what it is today, which is, I think this is kind of funny. So the X Games originally, or Extreme Games, were going to only be held in non summer Olympic years. And obviously, if they did one in 96, they almost immediately threw this out. But I think that's really funny because now BMX has made it to the Olympics. Like, this is a sport that came up enough to become an Olympic sport after being just a sideshow attraction for it a couple decades ago. And it is in no small part due to Matt Hoffman. For that reason, I believe it is our duty to induct not only the condor and a pioneer of the sport, but very clearly someone who successfully became the raddest guy alive. See, what, what, what I need to say is it might be a negative from Xavier's perspective that he was associated with Jackass. But to me, that's a very strong positive. I think Jackass is probably the epitome of just guys being dudes. So for them to have given Matt Hoffman their blessing is a very, very strong positive in my book. Well, I'm positive that we have some difficult stuff to do here because only one of these three guys is stylish enough to slide right on in to not just our DMs, but the hall itself. Is, is it someone drifting into their spot? Is it someone verting over a nine foot ramp into their spot? Is it someone who is earning their spot and then taking that plaque, dunking it and dunking it a second time in the air? Who do we lean to early here? This is a tough one. Right now, I'm leaning towards either the Drift King or Matt Hoffman. Not to say that, I'm not disrespecting the goat. I like the goat. Just, I don't know. I think we we got too little of him. Like, I I actually, at least I have seen the Drift King on YouTube a bunch, and I've seen Matt Hoffman do stuff. So it might just be, like, thinking of style, thinking of what I've actually seen. But that's where I'm leaning right now. He does suffer from the fact that there was nobody out with the camcorder. Like, if he came about... 30 years later, I think like he could have been like the Kimbo slice of the end one tour, except instead of cutting up in people's eyelids, he was just like jumping over them. Now there is something to be said for leaving him wanting more, but there's also, I think a link going all the way back to Vinko Bogote, where like my argument for him was this is someone who achieved virality before something like the internet existed and i do think it's notable that we are talking about earl manigault and we're talking about these stylish things he did without any documentation other than the accounts of him so he does have style that is so pervasive so noticeable and 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 persistent that it has gotten its way to us exclusively through oral history there's something to be said for that that's true but again, he's also not the only person of these three to go viral pre-internet. Oh, yeah. sure, sure. So I, I, I agree with the oral history part, although that also leads to the worry of how much of it was exaggerated. We don't know for sure. Like At least with Keiichi and the, his VHSs that went viral in, like the, in the 80s, shipping across the world, we can physically see that he was drifting phenomenally in his eight six this is absolutely the the point of vinko predating the internet with virality was not to say anything about these three like and their contemporaneousness with that it was more to say like we're looking at someone that achieved the you know widespread knowledge of 
their thing in this case style in that case virality without the primary means to do so that we might initially think of but enough about that enough about that i'm going to stop saying large <laughs> words with many syllables let's get back <laughs> to guys guys no, one, I, I, three letters that's where we need to stay i was just watching tony gonzalez catch three punts to give people 20 percent off their air dyson air fryers for god Amazon i Black love Friday. late stage capitalism sometimes <laughs> but that feels like the you don't need Tony Gonzalez to do that to get 20% off an air fryer. You could just go on Amazon like every other month and find one. I mean, I it's, don't know. It sounds it's, like it's Tony be- Gonzalez did just achieve that. It's better than Steph Curry bricking like 10 half court shots in a row when the money was going to go to like a, a kid's charity. It's better than when fucking college football has the Dr. Pepper, yeah, throw a cannon, I'll be crushed by student loan debt, baby. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, that, that, that was what distracted me, but let's get back to the case at hand here. We've drifted off course once again, which I think means it's time for us to consider the Drift King. I do. I, I love it. Lo- I just love drifting so much. I love cars. I mean, this is my own personal bias of loving Top Gear, loving Fast and Furious, loving all these drifting videos, loving mm. the old Ken Block videos. And just, it's, it was all started by the Drift King. I, ha- I have gotten so much enjoyment. Thanks to the thing that he did, taking the gamble of like doing a very highly illegal video and saying, this is going to be so cool that they're just going to have to let it be and being right. However, Xavier, I believe Matt Hoffman has appeared in more films with Vin Diesel. Uh, let me make sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Keiji Tsuchiya. Because one, he, it's one to one. On Tokyo th- no, yes, he is. On Tokyo yes, yes, he is. And he makes a cameo at the end. You cannot say this shit to me, the biggest Fast and Furious fan here. He shows up right at the end because Lucas Black, a.k.a. Sean Boswell, gets challenged. Lil Bow Wow comes in and says, hey, we got someone here to see you. He's like, ah, I'm not racing today. And he says, he's saying new Han. So then he goes to see him and they're side by side. And it's Sean Boswell in his drift car and Vin Diesel in his Dodge Charger. You cannot pull that shit on me, James. Look, far, I really should have known better to do this, given that I could not tell you the last time I watched Tokyo 3, or uh, Fast and Furious 3. Not never. It's not, not recently. It is not Fast and Furious 3. I'm saying it Sorry, is the, the Fast, fast and, and Furious, Furious, Furious Tokyo, Tokyo Drift. Yes. And then F- Fast and Furious, Fast 5, Fast and Furious 6, F9, Fast 6, Fast Fate, whatever. Fuck it all. Too Furious, uh, too Fast. <laughs> too Fast, Too Furious. Three guys, though. James just got me heated, and now I'm I am entrenched now with the Drift King because of this inaccuracy. Well, then let me look to you, Diaz. What is style if not being rad? What is Matt Hoffman if not the raddest guy alive? Mountain Dew and Pepsi saw it. Jackass saw it. Activision saw it. Everyone who needed a freestyle BMX guy to represent the sport during its ascendant phase turned to matt hoffman he was the cover for it outside of dave mira who i'm just gonna say committed a crime in philadelphia by stealing that gold medal in 2002 from mr matt hoffman and i think committing such a heinous crime in the city of philadelphia that you so dearly love and in that case also having matt hoffman be robbed in philadelphia means that you have all the more reason to try and make sure that he isn't robbed here so I, ha- I have made a decision, and I'm going to sufficiently ramble and preamble before I get to my decision. But I think we have two guys who really brought their sports to the forefront, right? To, to put it as you did, James, neither is the progenitor, but they are the people that brought it into the mainstream. And to me, with that being the, the characteristic that unifies them, It now becomes who brought their sport more into the mainstream. Now, drifting is very featured in movies. And we love the movies. And we love seeing people drift their cars on the big screen. We don't see them drift their cars in the Olympics. We do see BMX competed in the Olympics. So I believe that Matt Hoffman has done more to advance his sport. And That's therefore so he rough, though, because guy. when James said a BMX person, my first thought was Dave Mira. 
So you're saying that the second most popular BMX guy is you're giving him the credit for bringing that to the mainstream. Hey, just because just you, you were doing to me what the Jets did to me earlier. Jared Wilson just said, I don't know what to tell y'all. I don't know what to tell the fans. I'm out of words. I'm out. When asked if he'd ever seen struggling on offense like this, his his response was, yeah, last season. And Diaz is doing this to me again. God damn. Getting the second best BMX driver over the best drifter. And I have to admit, I you swerved me in there a little bit, Diaz. I ain't complaining. Like, look, far be it for me to to look a gift horse in the mouth. But when you were saying that, I thought you were about to start talking about how, like, not only do we have drifting in movies, we have drifting in so many video games, which, like, I bet the Nintendo is legal now. Probably pretty influenced by you know our good friends in Japan doing all that. Look, it's. I feel like I'm in this position a lot, having to choose between your two. And like, and they're both great. And I don't want to say neither is great. And I assure you, Xavier, it has nothing to do with the Jets. It has negative to do with the Jets. It has everything to do with the fact that one is an Olympic sport and the other one is not. Why did I settle on that as my criteria? I don't know. We kind of are just all bags in the wind ending up wherever we are. And that is where my logic took me today. I can't tell if this is worse than just letting you do it with chat GPT. It's about the same amount of thought going into it. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> and I mean that as an endorsement. <laughs> when drifting is at the Olympics, I'm coming back in the future and I'm going to give you shit. Look, and that, and that will be totally fine. And when such day occurs, I will welcome Keiji Suchia in with open arms. Perhaps I might even do so later this season on relitigation. But today... You know, it's Black Friday. It's the day after Thanksgiving. And there's a lot of things that we can give. We can give a lot of thanks to James for helping to come up with this great podcast that we get to come out with every week. We can give thanks to Xavier for continuing to be our guest. Although right now might be on the rocks a little bit. It might be a little difficult. Have but we, we finally scared him off. We appreciate you coming back. But we do really appreciate guys who have put their sport ahead of themselves and have elevated their sport to levels which we have never seen before to take a sport that was an in essence just how high bike go and now for that sport to be in the olympics it is an incredible achievement we now know how high bike go and we now know that that rider is now going to be a member of the hall of guy welcome one t one guy matt hoffman into the hall of guy Welcome, Matt Hoffman. Hey, Xavier, real quick. Is Bow Wow's character name in Tokyo Drift really Twinkie? Yes. It, it's because he's really good at getting, like, contraband stuff that they can't get really in Japan, one of them being Twinkies. The, his first interaction with Lucas Black's character, Sean, when Sean shows up in Japan, is essentially, like, saying he can get him, like, Jordans and, like, shoes and stuff that he doesn't have. And Twinkies. So uh, Diaz mentioned there for a moment that it is or has recently been Thanksgiving. Uh, it is, if you were listening to this today, it came out. Giving Monday, that's one of the ones that exists now. Editor's note, no, it's not, you dingus. It's, it's Giving Tuesday. I wanted to take a second as we are, uh, we, we mentioned earlier, in Indigenous Heritage Month, Native American History Month, whatever it is, it is a month where it is important to kind of like Remember that um, there are still a lot of very vibrant indigenous communities in America and across the world, and we've been trying to highlight that with our guys of the day this month, but I want to take a second, given that it is Giving Monday. Nope, still Giving Tuesday. And that we are all thinking about, um, I'm probably also getting whatever day it is wrong. I don't really care that much. You should donate, though, to some worthy causes this time of year, and I wanted to highlight some related to sports and indigenous Americans that that I think would be worthy of your support if you so choose. Uh, so just a couple to highlight real quick, and we'll put this information in the show notes. Uh, Spirit North in Canada, and just general participation in sports for indigenous communities. Turtle Island Hoops, that is a fully North American, American, US, and Canada, uh, just you know, basketball program run by Native Organizers Alliance. That's the organization you would donate to. And then also just like the Boys and Girls Clubs of America have a full Native Services wing that runs a lot on reservations and near other communities in the area so 
just something that I think you should consider uh, this time of year as we exit the month. If you want to, though, before the end of that month, see some of the phenomenal indigenous guys of the day that we have highlighted on our accounts, you can do so uh, at Blue Sky, on our Discord. All the information for those can be found at bit.ly slash remember that guy. All one word, all lowercase. We are all very thankful for uh, one another and, and our continued persistence in serving out our dark contract to fill this hall with as many good guys as we can. We are also very thankful to producer Craig for joining us in this journey. We are thankful to our musical director, Don Ham for kicking off every step of the journey every week with that lovely theme music. And we are thankful for you, dear listener, for joining us on this journey. We hope you'll do so next week. Anything else from you guys to say before that next go round? Not just the saddest J E T S of all time, Xavier. No, no, I'm good. <laughs> you are indeed good, Xavier. That's what you are. I, in the meantime, have been James. I've been the very special guest, Xavier. And I'm Diaz. And as Forrest Gump said when he was completed with his endeavors, I'm pretty guard. I think I'll go home now. Guard.